You are watching the Directing Animation Livecast, a special episode hosted by Kevin Lima. And I'll be interviewing Scott Weiser about his 10 feature film pitches and what he's learned as a director in the development process. Now, you should know Kevin Lima's name. If you don't, just a little bit of background about him. He directed the movies Tarzan, a goofy movie, Enchanted, Eloise. What was it? Eloise at Christmas time? Or- Eloise at the Plaza and Eloise at Eloise Christmas at the- time. Yeah. Yes, yes. And he has a lot of great projects under Twas Entertainment, his new production company, in the works. And I'm really excited to have you here, Kevin. Thank you so much for being willing to come on and interview me about my 10 pitches. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. It's good to be here. We'll have some yes. fun. We will. We will. And you've always been a great influence on my my career and my development as a director. And so it, I don't think I could have picked a better host for this. So. Let's um, let's talk at first. So these ten pitches, the we're going to go start from most recent. We're going to work backward. In the most recent five pitches, what I did is I had sixty ideas that I generated for feature films, and then what I did is I went in and because most of our you know about ten percent of our ideas are good maybe, and I went and narrowed those down to eleven and had people vote on them, and as we voted on them, we narrowed them down to five ideas. So that's what the first five pitches are. The, the five before that were more in depth. So I wrote books and kickstarted them and then pitched them at studios as feature films. And I also wrote, made a short film and made an animatic. And so we'll talk about those um, later on. And uh, yeah. Scott, Scott let, me, let me ask you about 60 ideas. How does, <laughs> how does anyone come up with 60 ideas? Did you truly have 60 fleshed out ideas for feature films? There were 60, they were more like log lines. Okay. All right. So, that's still a lot. That 60 it, is a tremendously large number. Yes. It was a little painful too. Uh-huh. So I would go to the library and it was during that pandemic. So they had a bunch of questions that I actually memorized. So I'd walk in and I'd tell them, no, I haven't been in contact with anyone with COVID and the past uh-huh. 14 days and all, all of this stuff. Right, right, and right. then I would walk around the library and I would just peruse books And sometimes I'd read the books more in detail and I would just be open to ideas. Okay. Okay. And the library is one of the most inspiring places in the world to me. It's like Disneyland, you know? So why don't you have an idea about a library? (laughs) I'm kidding. Was one of your 60 (laughs) ideas about a library? No. That's so interesting. That's so interesting. And then, uh, so so then you say you brought brought it down to like 10 ideas, correct? Yeah, 11. 11 ideas. Yeah. And those 11 were chose, chosen by you. You sort of weeded through the 60. Yeah, I weeded through them. And I'm like, actually, some of them kind of combined and became the same idea. Okay. So some of them, and there were some common threads that I was like, okay, which is the best of these common threads? I'll pick that one. Right, right, uh, right, right. Which do I think has the most market potential? And also, which can I be the most passionate about it? That's, right. that's really key. Right. And then you said that you had folks vote on them. Yes. Who were these folks? Where did they come from? How did you how did you get in contact with them? There are a bunch of random people that I've kind of picked up over the years that I I like their perspective and their opinion on things. A bunch of those work in the startup Ogden building with me where they have different businesses and stuff. So they have a different business mindset. And then a bunch of people are like a stay at home mom, a working mom, uh, you know, a single woman, uh, you know, Uh just Uh various people who. I'm able to, and from various backgrounds, that I'm able to hear different perspectives. Right, right. And how many people voted? How, how many people do you think voted? I, I think about 20. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then that got you down to this five that we're going to talk yes. about today. Yes. Okay. Down to these five pitches. All right. Cool. Now I totally understand how you got there. <laughs> awesome. And I remember presenting it to you when we were having a just a meeting uh, about something else. And you were like, how can I see these 50 pitches? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, so, How foolish of me to want to see 50 pitches. <laughs> I know. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that that be, be so or, incredibly overwhelming? I know. I know. <laughs> great, great. You want to yes, dive and, in? Yeah, yes. And before, before we dive in, if you, so we're going to introduce these pitches, but we're not going to go in depth. Each of these pitches has a poster that will display up on screen. It has a long essay about my vision for the film and the story and the plot and all of that stuff. So you can apply to go see those things at scottweiser.com slash collaborate. I have a whole pitch packet that you can go through and you can see all the material there. Right. So, yes, let's jump into it. All righty. Do you want to start with um, the very first one here? Chess, Chess Life. 
Here we go. A pawn from a makeshift chess set enters the world inside the chessboard to level up and become a more meaningful piece. But in the chaotic world where the collective unconscious of all chess players dream, he finds himself lost and more hopeless than ever before. It's an interesting idea. Thank you. <laughs> and um, how, since we're doing this one first, where did it rate in, your, in, in the voting? This was the landslide vote. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it got tons more votes than any other idea in the, the whole Oh, wow. The whole list. Yeah. Oh, wow. The problem for me is, you know, as a director, you have to have that spark in there that just drives you to make the thing. Right. Right. The problem for me with this one is I, I kind of felt that spark, but it felt like a short film. How did yeah. you, how, how, how did you go about turning it into a feature? Where did that, where did that come from? How did, how did it develop? Well, what I did is I, one of the people who was the most enthusiastic about the project has been become passionate about chess. Yeah. And uh, he has lots of free time on his hands. He's a multimillionaire, just really interesting guy. And so he's always right. trying to, to try something new. And so I started talking to him about his passion about chess. Right. And after a while, he's like, your questions would be so much better answered by a friend of mine who's one of the top 100 chess players in the world. Oh, wow. Because they rank you by how well you score and how many games you play and who you play against, right? Right. And this guy has an Instagram that all he does is talk about chess, you know? Oh, wow. And so I got him on a call and we started talking about his passion about chess. I ran some of the ideas I have for the story by him. Yeah. And the more we went on, the more he got passionate about chess. And at one point he said something about chess being about life. And I asked him to explain more about that. And by the time I left that meeting, I thought, okay, now I have a feature film. Okay. Now okay. I have something that is more in depth. Um, one of the things he said that was interesting is that you know, once you make the first couple of moves, there are just millions of possibilities mm -hmm. of way, the ways the, the game can go. And right. I mean, that sounds a lot that, like life, doesn't it, in a way? It does. It does. <laughs> yeah. There are so many paths that people can take. Yes. Yes. And the crazy thing about this project also is, you know, as I developed it, I kept thinking, you know, it's good because people, lots of people, as they would review even the essays, they would say, yeah, this is great. And they'd move on. But I luckily did have some people that challenged me on things and got me to rewrite this story several times. Right. And I think one of the most powerful lessons about this one is even if people are saying it's good, there's always something in there that you can push a little bit further, which is. That, that, that's always true. And that's something you'll do throughout the entire development of a movie, right? Is that yeah. you're constantly looking for the better way, the way to push forward. So even when you feel like you have this great idea to begin with, that the kernel is so perfect, you are still always looking for ways to improve it to the very, very end. And that's yes. one of the wonderful things about animation, I think, is that yes. you can constantly affect the, the idea, right? Yeah. And you have time. Right. With a live action feature, you're just rush, rush, rushing, right? With, with the animation. Absolutely. You still need to move at a healthy pace, but you have a bit more time to kind of let things ruminate. You can, yeah, you can ponder. I, I, I often think like, like animation is like clay in a way, is that you yeah. can make something and if you stand back and look at it and say, hey, something's not right about this, you can go in and you can rip a piece of it off and you yes. can build a new piece, hopefully a piece that was more aesthetically pleasing. Um, and an animated film is very much like that because you edit the film before you actually animate the film. Yes. So, Makes a big difference. Yeah. 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 Great comments. <laughs> so, yeah. Let's move on to Cecile and the animal okay. spirits. And the animal spirits. A young girl whose best friends are spirit animals embarks on a search for a clear meaning behind the death of her parents and discovers how messy the past can be. Well, that sounds deep. It does sound deep. It really it? does. It really does. When, the, when, when you use this short log line, you know, a clear meaning behind the death of her parents is impactful. Thank you. Yeah. Where did this come from? Where did it come from? I, there's some of these that I don't even remember where I was when, when oh, really? it popped in my mind. Yeah. Really? Huh. Oh, I do. I do. Okay. I do remember. I really love Luna Lovegood in Harry Potter. And I've always felt like there's more, more meat there than she gets. Okay. And she, this character isn't quite Luna Lovegood. She's a lot more bitterness that she carries with her than Luna does. Luna's a little bit more lighthearted. Uh -huh. But uh, that was the starting place. Was like I, I want to see a character more like that. I rarely see characters 
in that vein of uh, mm. personality types. Okay. So, yeah. Very, very cool. And then, um, actually, so when I, the voting started, the people who responded to me soonest were the entrepreneurs. And this wasn't even ranking. <laughs> oh, really? And, and I found myself getting upset because it feels deep. It, it feels like there's something wonderful there. And I was like, but why aren't you voting for Cecile? You know, in the back of my mind, <laughs> I was saying that. But then all of a sudden, the people who took a little longer were the ones who were voting on Cecile. And Cecile oh, really? suddenly just grew up and was in the ranking. Oh, wow. So wow. that was a wonderful thing to me. Another thing, interesting thing about the development of this is I had, I actually had a group of people who in, in my billing, the entrepreneurs who I had them read them ahead of time. And then we went into a room for a discussion about all five and you yeah. want to have a painful experience. <laughs> oh, I've been in those rooms. Believe me. So I know what they feel like. Oh yes. Yes. And um, the funny thing is I had said something uh, like a controversial opinion uh, of what I think about a trend in films, right? And, and I wrote that as the first sentence in this essay about Cecile. And this man and his, hu- or man and his wife yeah. got offended by that line. <laughs> and oh, they were really? just like, we don't like that. It's just icky. It's just gross. And, and we would discuss it. We would discuss it. And, and there was something in that line that I wanted to keep that wasn't in the rest of the essay. So I, I kept wanting to, to have that line in there. But the more we talked, the more I was like, you know, maybe I could change it. So I had to think of like, what is the little kernel of truth, a kernel of creativity in that line that I really want to keep? And once I figured that out, I was able to scrap the line and and write a more compelling intro that wouldn't offend people. (laughs) Really? Really? Yeah. And so that was a wonderful experience. can, can Can you share what that line was about? Can you share what was so controversial about that? Um, It, it was more quite a while ago, I saw a Ted talk about, he was talking about female protagonists in film. Okay. And, and he was talking about how he'd like to see them change. He wouldn't like to, he doesn't want them to be men dressed up in women's bodies. Right. right, right he right. wants them to actually ha- be feminine in, in a unique way and strong in their unique way and that sort of thing. So right. it, it had to do with that. I think it was just poorly worded. Right, right, right. Yeah. It has been a criticism, I I think, of a lot of female protagonists having to feel like a tomboy in order to be active and, um, you know, (laughs) for for us to engage with them. And there's also a fear in Hollywood that boys will not go to see films about girls. So there's this thing that happens within within the, the culture in which they want to lean the girls to be more like boys, sort of. So so they feel like you know boys with female voices in yeah. a way. And if you look yeah. at a lot of the films, that's what you get. And mm-hmm. I know that I'm married. You know, I'm married to Brenda Chapman, and yeah. it was a big sort of fight for her to to have characters that felt like women or felt yeah. like girls. Um, working in an industry with all guys. So that's interesting that you want to pursue that. Um, yes. That's been a common a, thread since Cirque du Solitude, actually. That's been a yeah, common yeah, thread. Yeah. Anytime I have a female protagonist, I really think very hard about that. I run it by my wife. I run it by women from different perspectives. Right, right. Well, and, what's very interesting is that when I, when I read through the list, I was surprised that most of your characters are female. Yeah. Most of your lead characters are female. Yeah, and we start it's about, about oh, I wonder where I wonder where that comes from. I wonder where that leaning. It's about sixty percent. Yeah, sixty to seventy are, are female. Yeah, I just think women are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any more complex than the answer than no, that. No, no, no. It's just the reason. I mean, that, that's a that's a justifiable reason. Um, I will I will tell one story. I was bullied a lot as a teenager. You know. Yeah. A junior high was especially tough for me. I toughened up by by high school, and I could actually really hold my own. And Welcome to being an me. artist, to be quite honest with you. I mean, so yeah, many yeah. of us share that same story. Yeah, and there was this group of girls that would sit close to me, and they were they were kind of like mother hens, you know? Uh-huh. They were really protecting me from things and encouraging me, and when they saw something negative, they would step in and do something about it. They could have a big, big thing to do with that. Right. Yeah. Right, so, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, let's move on to the next one. Another female protagonist. <laughs> Another one. Nothing. Called nothing. Nothing. 
An emotionless woman with a brilliant engineering mind discovers that the machine that keeps her magical, chaotic world bending emotions in check is failing. Wow. So this sounds like it has some science fiction edges to it. Science fiction edges to it, yeah. A lot of emotion involved. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. So this, this popped into my head on the walk from the library to the movie theater. A film I'd worked on four years before it called Henchman finally came out. It went okay. through distribution problems. <laughs> right. And right. so as I'm walking out of the theater, it just popped into my head. And the, the feeling I got was so visceral. I was like, oh, I've got to make this one. And it didn't rank at all in the voting. <laughs> oh, really? So you've cheated a little bit. <laughs> well, you, br- you brought in one that didn't rank in the voting. Yes, yes. Uh, you're allowed. <laughs> They're your <Yeah>. ideas. <laughs> There's a book. Um, there's a book that my last guest, Daniel Harmon, recommended called "The User Method," and it talked about how all these great innovations in the world have come about, and a lot of them have come about because there's something that that one user wants to see, right? Or that one user needs to use. Right. And uh, just knocked over Aesop's fables here. <laughs> They're important. I actually studied Aesop's fables in depth as I was writing these as well because those stories have really stood the test of time. They're amazing. Right, right. And they all have um, morals, right? So they all have very succinct sort of moral ideas at their center that are easy to grab a hold of. Yes. And that's right. one of the reasons they, they've stood the test of time. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, when when it didn't rank, I just thought, you know, I'm going to slip this in and see. And I actually took the next one in line and put it as number six, just in case. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Just in case I was like, ah, this isn't working out. <laughs> and funny thing is first essay, I give it out to the people to read it. And the first person to reply to me says, this is weird. I wouldn't want to see it. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And luckily, you know, I, I've been around the block a few times. I knew that he didn't really know how to good feed, good feedback at that point. You know, <laughs> like I told him, I was like, tell me if you're bored or confused. That's what I want to know. If you're right. bored and confused or you know, just if you need clarification. So I asked him, well, where in the outline did you decide that? And he pointed it out to me and I was like, okay, that's, that's something to go by. And so then we had a wonderful discussion. The man's very brilliant and uh, has a lot of insight about many different topics. So we got into a good conversation. I rewrote the essay. And then there was a, a female reader who got back to me and she said, this one is my favorite and I need to see, I need this movie. Mm-hmm. And it's because she's been through a lot of depression and anxiety through her life and been through a lot of therapy. And she shared all these wonderful things that actually are in the outline oh, <laughs> They're really? in the essay. Oh, yes. Wow. Wow. Because they were that potent and powerful. And so this is one of my favorite, which I, and another thing I have these people in my building that every time they walk by that poster, they say they get goosebumps. So oh, wow. it's, this, this is a wonderful project. I, I've been happy that I stuck with it, you know, <laughs> even though, you know, some people batted it down. It sounds like it could be a project that is sort of emotionally sort of charged for some people. Mm. Right. Because you yeah. have, BB, because you have, you know, d- depending upon where you are, as far as, I mean, it, it, dealing with, you know, mental illness or any of those sorts of things. I mean, this feels like a woman who has a machine that stops her or who keeps her in check, right? Who keeps all of her emotions in check. Yeah. And that is, you know, that is sort of a a controversial subject. (laughs) Yeah. Right? Now it is. So it's it's sort of interesting to explore something that could have sort of um, you know, ramification or 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 be metaphoric. Yeah. for what's going on in, in, in the world of mental illness. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Hmm. Well, wonderful. Let's, uh, let's move on to Painter's mm-hmm. Touch. Pamela Cross, a wealthy young socialite on a permanent vacation to Paris, develops a fascination with an old traveler with almost magical painting skills that inspire remarkable changes in people's lives. Wow. Mm-hmm. The fun thing about these projects is, as I've had people vote on them and everything, everybody mm-hmm. picks a favorite. Right? right, right, right. And I bet yeah. the artists chose this one. Yes. <laughs> <I was gonna laughs> Anybody say. who's on the more creative end chose yeah. this one. Right, right. 
That's, yeah, in, that, that's interesting. Magical painting skills. Um, what? I'm wondering how, you know, we, 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 we talked about going to the library. Where did you being an artist, where did this idea come from? It you, didn't come from the library. Yeah. It resurfaced. Okay. So I, when I was a young child, I would write musicals and then I would make the neighborhood kids do them. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any of those? I'd love to hear one. <laughs> uh, well, this is one of them. Oh, seriously? Yeah. Yeah. It was a musical called, um, was it called The Painter's Touch? I don't think it was called that. Right. It had a different that sounds, name. That's, that sounds pretty mature. The Painter's Touch for a, yeah, for a yeah. young kid. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I, when I was in college, I was writing, I was really being tr trying to be really creative. Right. And I had this uh -huh. fiction writing teacher that he, he wrote things that were very based in reality and, you know, Right. And so he had a hard time with me as a student. Um, he, he just kept telling me, you know, creative people like you have a hard time being clear. <laughs> oh, really? And yeah, because a lot of my stuff kind of got abstract and, and that sort of thing. And I was like, I'll prove to you that I can do something clear. And I actually wrote this as a short story. Okay. And he's like, this is what I was talking about. <laughs> right, 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 right. So this one I marked off as done in my brain. I was like, I've done that, right? But there was something deeper there that I think resurfaced, resurfaced as I was going to the library. Funny thing is when we went to the essay stage where I was having people review the essays mm -hmm. and the posters, the person who reviewed this one, she's amazing. I think I'll have her go over my material. You know, oh, really? anything I'm doing, I think I could run by her. She's so smart and methodical and she asks great questions. And I realized through the process of what she was telling me that this story was the actual story, not the one that was in the outline, was something I was very afraid of telling. Really? Um, it's about is this, a father. A is this father person leaves. a therapist? Is this no, a, she's not. No, she's, she's not. not. She just she writes it. business plans for uh, people who want migrant workers. Wow. And she writes business pl plans for them. So she, uh, she just, she was kind of struggling with it. She's like, well, what are you trying to do here? What are you trying to do there? And I realized this is a story I'm very afraid of telling. Oh, really? And so I was kind of burying it and not telling her what it was. And once I realized that, you know, and part of it is like, you know, I, I'm all about being a great father to my family. And this is about a father who's left his family right? and trying to wrap my head around that, you know, right. and uh, it's a very deep, heavy subject. And so I was afraid of telling the story, but now I realize, nope, you got to double down. You've got to, you've got to commit to it. Is it because the story is real to you? because it comes from your life or? Yeah, I think there's a, I think I have a fear that someday I might just throw my hands up and say, I'm done. Oh, know? really? Oh, really? And uh, yeah. How about, how about your, um, what was, I mean, this is very really personal, but I can, from, from my point of view, it is my story, right? So I had a father who left when I was 12. Oh, interesting. And I didn't see that man again for 25 years. Yeah. So, so when you, when you talk about it, having those layers, it, it, it absolutely feels real to me. It happens in the world all the time. Yeah. Was your father a good man? He was. Okay, good. Yeah. Good, good, good. He, so this uh, is more about a fear that, yeah. that, that you have, than it actually is about something that's happened to you. Right. Right. Yeah. I've yeah. seen it happen though to many people. Yeah. yeah. And I've seen the ramifications of that. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's hard. Right. Absolutely. That's very hard. So this also could be a project for me to, to develop empathy for that situation as well. Right. I always find there's something about that. Something I'm trying to figure out that that's how these stories. Practice. Absolutely. The best, the best stories come from you, right? That, that feel very incredibly personal yeah. to you. So. Yeah. Interesting thing is one of the reasons that fathers leave their families is because they don't feel good enough. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Well, it was surprising when I found it out, though, because I had to go look it up, you know, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> after I realized that's what this story was about. Right, right, right. So. Makes perfect sense. That's the way it was in my family. <laughs> there you go. So anything else you want to say about that one? No, no. I think okay. we can go on to the next one. Okay. Which is? Kinderlateral. As his once successful financial company collapses into bankruptcy, CEO Ian Stein finds himself unexplainably switching between reality and the dimension of childhood. 
some more science fiction. Um, <laughs> science fiction fantasy. Yeah, yeah, where's yeah. the line? But <laughs> right, right. it seems like most of your most of your projects live in that world, right? Yeah, um, I do like fantasy. I like magic. Yeah, I think we need a bit more magic in the world. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And magic can be absolutely real in these types of stories in an animated film, right? It can exist in a tangible way. Yeah. And sometimes you can go into deep subjects a little bit deeper when there's this fantastic removal, you know? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, and I think that, that plays a role. With this right. one, this was interesting. This is one I have had floating around in my mind for a long time. Oh, really? uh, the, original, the original manifestation of this was just a guy going crazy working for a company. There was no fantasy. Uh-huh. <laughs> involved in it uh-huh. and then i was like that's kind of a tough tough sale you know your main character goes crazy um, <laughs> <laughs> and you probably could relate to that i can imagine being in a job i mean i've been in many jobs where i felt like i was going crazy yeah um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how was i going to get out of this one um well so- i wrote i was i was at a very tough company where i was doing animation school and working full-time at a company and yeah there were there were ways people would treat me that i would have to go in the back room and like just stew for a bit before I went and interacted with anybody or I would blow up, you know? Uh-huh. And so I wrote this, the original story during this time. And my wife looked at it and she's like, it's too close. <laughs> You're too close to the story. You can't really see the, you know, the trees from the sky or the clouds. Right, right. So yeah. And then this, this was called gateway to childhood. When I first started having people uh, review the essay. Yeah. And this was one that entrepreneurs really love. Like business-minded people really love this story. They can just relate to it. Um, so this mm-hmm. this really ranked high with that group of people. Right. And uh, and this is before, or, or, or was this after you had sort of adapted it to being more of a fantasy? Both. Both. <laughs> okay. Both, yeah. Okay. Um, it just kind of, it's hard to own your own business. It's a really challenging thing. So mm-hmm. I think that pe- lots of people can connect to it. And you can also connect to just working at a bad job, as you mentioned. And then, um, yeah, Gateway to Childhood, it had, he was actually laying face down on his desk and there was a tear coming about it out of his eye. It was kind of spreading out in this kind of interesting pattern. That was what this, is an illustra- this is an illustration that you're talking this about. This is what the poster used to look like. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. And then somebody looked at it. He's like, this is really dark for you, Scott. That man was shot in the back and now he's laying face down on the. <laughs> he saw violence in it, you know, right, that, right. that I wasn't intending. Right. Um, so between that and somebody saying they thought the name was wrong, Gateway to Childhood, they thought it was on the nose. Mm-hmm. And then I also realized that if I had this guy go like Alice in Wonderland into this world, like Alice in Wonderland, he either get lost or never want to leave the world. And I needed a way to pull this guy back into reality and make him face it, you know? Right, right. Because that's kind of how we have to function. Sometimes we can go on flights, flights of fancy, and sometimes we have to face reality. And so that's where kinderlateral, this idea of a parallel universe, was was born. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, that's the end of the five pitches that we developed together. So that was 60 to 11 to 5. Yes. Wow. It's kind yeah. of it's kind of shocking. And 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 I've read the I've read all the outlines. I've actually read the film pitches. Oh, um, great. <laughs> I did. I did. And um there's I, I have to commend you on the amount of work that it that that you've put into 10 ideas. It's kind Thanks. of it's kind of remarkable. To me, I was I was Thank going you. through and said, "Boy, I've I mean, I where I work at a company where we now have like twenty three ideas that we're molding, but I have, but it's me and Brenda and two other people doing yes. this. I couldn't imagine being able to focus myself down to get to ten fully fleshed out ideas in the way that you have. Yeah. Um, how long did this take? How long did this whole process take for you? I know I began." going to the library back in November. And then I just finished the the pitch deck for you to look at all the 10 pitches about two weeks ago. Right. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, so. a, that's a short amount of a short amount of time for, especially when you're doing freelance. I'm, I have tons of freelance customers right. that just keep coming back, coming back and begging for work. So, right. So you're working while yeah. you're doing all this at the same time. 
yeah, your core yeah. family, do they ever see you? Do you ever? They do. <laughs> they do. I try to really schedule that time for them. Right. Right. So, yeah. Good for you. Good for yeah, you. Thanks. I've always, you know, I've always said that the way that you become is to do. Yes. And you are a doer. This is, I mean, obviously you, you know, you have put, you invested a huge amount of time into making this happen for yourself. Yes. And That's I want it bad. I want That's it really bad. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you can see that. I'm glad you can detect that. Absolutely. So let's talk about, now, interestingly about these next two projects, I was thinking about having them blurred in the pit, in this video and not mentioning the titles, but I think it's wise to just share them. The reason I was thinking about having them blurred is they have interest. I have a producing partner for the unsinkable song and I have a publisher for Masked Magic. So, right. um, but we're going to show these to you on screen. Okay. So cool. let's go. How great of you? <laughs> <laughs> it took a lot of deliberation. So let's, let's talk about the unsingable song. So this is a musical fantasy, it says here. A full musical, so going back to uh, your childhood again, right? Yes. Right, a musical. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here we go. On their quest for fame, a Puerto Rican woman and a living statue mess up the balance of nature and put everyone's lives in danger. That sounds big. <laughs> it sounds big. That's it amazing. Sounds, it, it sounds both intimate, because I can imagine a relationship between these two characters, which are Again, it's magical, right? A Puerto Rican woman in a living statue. Yeah. But when you say put everyone's lives in danger, that word everyone makes it feel like, wow, suddenly like this is like a big world sort of catastrophe thing that might be introduced here. That's caused by these two people's dream. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, this, this one, if I could pick any of the 10 to do right now, it would be this one. Oh, wow. And that's why it's fortunate that I have that uh, producing partner who has a studio. Right. And I can't really give too many details right now. I promise to keep several of the things that are going on hush hush right now. Okay. But suffice it to say, he's a wonderful partner and I hope we get to work together. He just has a lot of skills that I, I need in a partner. So how, how, how long had you been developing this piece before you started showing it? This one is, is a very old piece. It, yeah. it's, it's from my early days where I was still thinking about doing musical theater. Right. And I think it back then it was called the statue. Okay. And it, uh, it just kind of a sat there and changed several times. And then it was, it was when I had a friend who was, cause it was originally set in a European country okay. and a friend had come back from a vacation from Puerto Rico. Right. And the way he talked about Puerto Rico got me just, passionate, you know, about Puerto Rico. And I'd never uh, even been there. Right. And I was like, you know, we really should set a film there. It sounds like the perfect place to make a film. So then and so I, things came together. Yeah. I bought all three books or I bought, I borrowed all three books from the library system. There weren't very many books on Puerto Rico yeah. and just read those thoroughly and tried to come uh, up with ideas. And this was the one that just surfaced. It just all of a sudden just popped up in Puerto Rico. And it's a lot more powerful of an idea now that right, it's set right. there because of all the people have to go through there. They've been through a lot if you studied the history of Puerto Rico. Right, right. And then... Who's, so, um, who's uh, one more question. Who's, uh, who's writing your music? It's a musical. I wrote, I'm writing it. You're writing it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That was my dream as a child was to write musicals. So I wrote the song and the lyrics and wrote the yeah. piano accompaniment for the, the main parts. And then I brought in a co-composer who's half Costa Rican. Yeah. And had him flesh it all out and add all the instruments and, and the flavor that we needed. Oh, wow. It sounds like you already have demos or a demo. Yeah, we created an animatic for this. So this was the oh, first wow. time. Because before this, and I even have like 20 projects that I did as a kid and stuff before these 10. Yeah. I, I've been doing projects like these for years. You know, I just have always wanted to do something like this. So with, with this one, this was the first one that I was like, I'm going to create an animatic. And I'm going to start diverging from this idea of writing these illustrated novels that I pitch at studios as films. And I'm glad I did <laughs> because it's had the most feedback. I've gotten the most response. I've gotten the most enthusiasm from this project. Right. And I mean, the reason I did it also is because it's a musical. How can you prove a musical in a, in an illustrated novel? It's just very difficult to do. Right, right, right. No, that makes sense. And so, if you have those talents, you might as well use them to your benefit, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, because because a lot of times I find that 
that it's hard to take the step and imagine something. Imagine that next step. If you can draw a storyboard, you are imagining it for them. You are putting yes. those images on the screen for people. So right. I mean, it, it, it might be one of the reasons that you've gotten some some real interest in it. Yeah. You know? There's also something about the music. I I all my life I've wanted to see films with more of the music that I grew up when I because I would study every musical out there. Uh-huh. In fact. I, I don't know many of the bands that were popular at the time. <laughs> I don't have many of those CDs when I was in high school because I was like always obsessed with the next musical. And right. Right, right. <laughs> people were like, what is this show? I've never even heard of it, you know? Right, like, right. Well, Stephen Sondheim wrote this. Like Stephen <laughs> Schwartz wrote this. Don't you How know? How can you not <laughs> know them? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, and, and I've also wished that I saw more. I always thought it would be cool to have a Miyazaki musical. Um, with kind of the depth of stories that he has, but also having music as part of it. And, and then the other thing about this story is I really, I would only do a musical if, if I felt like it was integral to the core of the story. And that's something about this project too. Like it's, it is a musical because it's supposed to be, not because it's, uh, it's popular. <laughs> right, right. So. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Also has a female lead. Just a female lead. <laughs> yeah. Although the male and the female do share a lot of screen time. Do they? Okay. Yeah. It's a pretty even split down the middle of, of who it does. It does focus a bit more on her though. But she is, the, she's the protagonist. Right. Right. Cool. Do you want to go, you want to move on or you, you have something? Yeah, let's you move on to masked magic. Okay. Five unlikely friends find magical masks that can give them the power to become anything they've ever imagined. But if worn too long, these masks will steal their identity. Wow. This Ooh. feels like it has like the, <laughs> the, the DNA of like a 1980s Amblin movie. Yes. In some way. That's what, yes. it, that's what it feels like to me when just from reading the log line. Good, good. Cause that's what I'm going for. Although I'm pushing it into the nineties cause yeah. that's when I, w- I was in junior high in the nineties. Okay. So it's okay. easier to write from that perspective. Okay. Okay. But yeah, the eighties and the nineties are kind of, you know, eighties rolled into the nineties and yeah. That's about what age you were. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Oh, right. So, so this is something you also mentioned that this is also has some interest out there in the world. Yes. I, so the first two or a couple of books that I did, I, uh, I self publish them. Okay. And the reasons for that that we'll go into as, as we talk about each of those projects, but uh, I self-published them through Kickstarter. Really, the, the reason I was writing them just to prove to myself I could develop feature film-like content and prove it to others as well. Right, okay. And uh, with Masked Magic, I thought, you know, I, I really should experiment with the publishing process, like actually try to get an agent, actually right. try to pitch it to right. publishers and all of and that. And you already had a couple of books at this point. Yeah, yeah. So you, could, so, like, so you could actually put something on the table and say, see, I, I have done this. Right, right. Okay. And so the beautiful thing about this project is I did learn from the process. I've learned. Uh, the interesting thing about writing books, though, <laughs> is that they're not screenplays. There's right. so, there are different rules for books than there are for screenplays. So anytime I would get feedback from, I have a friend who's the art director of a uh, New York Times bestseller, and he'd give me feedback. And I'd have to listen to him and say, that's really good feedback, but I have to apply it to something to do with directing. And so hmm. I would say, oh, yeah, if you want to hear the internal dialogue, that's me giving di- uh, directors um, guidance. Like, that's me giving director notes to the actor, like giving them inside the character's head. Oh. And uh, there are several other notes. There was one, the, the trickiest thing with this book was the voice of the main character. It was, I knew, I had a sense I wasn't hitting it quite right. Right. And uh, that's what actually deterred some of the agents. I had one agent. She's a pretty big agent. She held on to it for six months because she loved the story. She loved the Mm -hmm. art. She loved the characters. But she's like, the writing isn't quite working. Um, And this publisher has really helped with that. So they keep giving me this feedback of what what to change in the writing and how to make it more appealing as a book itself and not just like a concept for a a film. Right, right. And uh, I mean, again constantly sort of looking at the material and thinking about, okay, how does, how does it take a next step? How does it get better? Right. Yeah. yeah. And that, and that really comes from, you know, what we do in the world of animation. Yeah. It's constantly analyzing what's in front of you. Right. 
Also with this project, I thought, you know, I think the books have served their purpose. I'm going to move on. And that was kind of my gut instinct. Like I just kept, it just kept coming back into my mind. And then when this, this agent who held up to it for six months came back to me and said, how about you make it into a graphic novel? <laughs> right. Um, then I thought, you know, she's saying you should make films. And I, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, that's but a, you're still pursuing this as a, as a, as a novel. Yeah. Because I have that publisher interested in it. Yeah. He also owns an animation studio and a publishing company. And so he gets it. He gets what I'm trying to do. Okay. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll put it out into the world and see, see what it does. Cool. Now I will say that there are people who've read, cause I, I'll have the readers, the beta readers, right. Who've read all three of the books and by far, they think this is the best. Oh, really? Yeah. I walked in as one of them just finished my, my wife <laughs> and she's hard on me. Like, <laughs> She gives me honest feedback. Yeah. She's just sitting there <laughs> because what? they know you're, they tend to be because they know you're going to love, you're, you're still going to love them at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But she's sitting in, in bed after she'd finished this and she's like, wow, <laughs> she's just oh, really? floored. So that's a good reaction. That's, a good no, reaction that's, that's really, that's very, very good. So, and so then she, she told me the last chapter stunk. So I rewrote the last chapter. <laughs> she's like, after that, you, you do that. <laughs> Why did you do that? So, yeah, we wrote, we wrote the last chapter. <laughs> Very cool. And you're still looking for, are you still looking for the character's voice, the main character's voice? Or do you feel no, like you I, found it? I think we've hit it. I think yeah. the main problem was I was, I would, I would slip into reporter mode mm -hmm. because this girl dreams of being a, a writer someday. And I thought, you know, I thought she would slip into reporter mode, but that actually pulls people out of the story where an example of this would use, which is you'd say the emotion before the thing happened. So, uh, this really made me really angry when this happened, when this kid came over. Like, I would tell you the emotion first, but right. you really should say this happened, then this was my reaction to it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So a lot of it was sentence order and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, let's move to Cirque de Solitude. A, I, well, a timid woman buys her own private island to be alone, only to discover it is already inhabited by circus people. This is one of your books. This yeah. is one of your self-published books. This is I one know of that books. because I have it. You have that book, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you also did part of this. As, I mean, was this a Kickstarter, if I remember correctly? It was a Kickstarter. And for this yeah. one, I, tr I pulled out all the stops. And I tried any strategy I could. Like, I wrote a song for the credits and, yeah. and performed that song and had, yeah. have it on YouTube on my channel. Yeah. Um, I did drawing tutorials and... I wanted to have a, an auction, like a, a contest. That, that's what it okay. was, a contest where contest. people did fan art. Uh -huh. And uh, Kickstarter does not allow that, actually. Oh, really? So I actually had to change what that event was. But um, yeah, we, uh, we did well. We funded <laughs> I know, project. because I have a book on my shelf. I know you have a physical funded. copy. Uh -huh. and, and this one's really rewarding because it's out in the world now. And I had a young girl who... Uh, I see once in a while who had a copy of the book and she, her parents came to me recently and said, our daughter has reread and reread and reread that story over and over again. Oh, that's great. And she loves it. It's, it's one of her favorite books. And that's really that's rewarding. Great. That makes, right. you know, writing right. the book worth right. it. And you can, I mean, it's available, right? You can buy it on Amazon, I think, right? Yes, you can. Yeah. You can buy it on Amazon, Facebook. This isn't a commercial for you. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it has a bunch of beautiful illustrations in it and, yeah, right. Tw right. twice the illustrations of Vanishing Ink. That was my goal. With Mass Magic, the goal was to have full color illustrations because people kept asking me for full color. Okay. They see these vibrant colors and they say, hey, where's the color? Let's get inside. Right, so, right, right, right. Um, Many books are like that. That's not unusual for a, right. for a book. So, yeah. Yeah. So, with this, this one was interesting. I, uh, I think one, thing, one of the things I learned about this story. I tried to keep it in the outline stage more than I did Vanishing Ink. But even then, I once I wrote it, I got some good feedback from that New York Times bestselling art director. And I had to completely rewrite it. Oh, really? And then I'd, I'd get another person reading it who I really respected, who was a good storyteller. And then I'd completely rewrite it, right? And so because of that, I spent longer in the out, outline stage again in Masked Magic. Because you could just make a lot more changes when you're at that stage. It's much easier to 
move scenes around and, and that sort right, of thing, right, right. and keep things continuous and that sort of thing. Right. But uh, I was I was really proud of the project. It's really great. It's one of those films I think I'd, I'd be able to direct on as eighty because that's the other thing. When I was pitching uh, Vanishing Ink at the different studios I was working uh-huh. at, I did actually get an agent who was very interested in working with me. And once I showed her Cirque du Solitude, she asked me if I could change the age of the main character to a teenager. Because that's kind of the rules of the public publishing industry. If it has illustrations, it's about a, a tween book, and you have to have mm-hmm. the character close to their ages. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, well, can you make Mr. Incredible a teenager? Like, can you make Giselle from Enchanted a teenager? Like, the, the story would fall apart. Mm-hmm. Although she's kind of going into adulthood, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's on she's, that cusp. Yeah, but you couldn't make her a even, even, even though when she comes into the, the real world, she's Amy Adams, and Amy Adams is in her 30s. So, <laughs> Right, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, so. I, I, I mean, I guess I understand that a little bit, is that, mm-hmm. you know, that, that age group wants to read about themselves. Yeah. In a sense, or they want to read about, about you know, kids that are just a bit older than them. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so this was something that you said, I didn't want to change it because it would fall, the story would just fall apart. Yeah, I, I tried actually. Yeah. I experimented with it and re outlined it, but it's just like this story, like, it it's wasn't a different, compelling. It's a different story, right? It yeah, a, yeah, it was a completely different, different story. story. And actually, the agent, she was very encouraging. She was very supportive. She's like, you know, it's beautiful. You should write it in anyway. So I did. Right. Yeah. yeah, and she's who I, I developed Mass Magic with. And the other reason she's not my agent is that she transitioned into doing more producing for film. And so oh, really? she kind of left her publishing behind a little bit, which I could completely resonate with. So I was like, right. you know. Because you are ready to leave your publishing behind to, yes. to direct a movie, right? Your yes, true, as much your as I enjoy it. Right. Yeah. Right. So let's enough about books. Let's talk about a film. <laughs> A film that you, uh, a short film that you've made. Yeah. Right? Layers. Layers. In her climb to find much needed food, a weary traveler digs through the many layers in memories of her life. And that's pretty much the, the outline for the short film, right? Yes. The, the log line for the short film. Yes. And uh, I see here that you have a feature film log line. Which means yeah. you're already thinking about it as a as a, a feature film that you're. Well, yeah. yeah, I even had a production company approach me about it. Like, oh really? Have have somebody approach me about it and say, what would the feature look like? So, yeah, that's definitely been in the in the brain. <laughs> and is this this feature film logline, which I'll read in a moment, is this based on those explorations? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So it would be it would be the same concept, that same idea that you can just take off a layer of your life, you get younger, and in that layer there are memories that may help you or hinder you some way on your journey. Right, right. Yeah. We are all made up of our of our pasts, right? Yes. Um, and can they see this? Is is this available to actually watch this this the short film layers? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. The okay. link is, again, you can go and you can sign up at scottweiser.com slash collaborate yeah. to be able to review all the pitches. The link is in the pitch. And okay. it's also I, on my Vimeo and okay. on this on this YouTube channel. So you can see, you can see cool. it there. The Vimeo actually has an update on it because I screened it at a festival where there was a, a deaf person. And she said, I loved your, I loved your film because I could understand it. Right. Or she had somebody else tell me that. <laughs> right. And then, um, then she, I said, well, there is one word in it. And it's when the, the old, her husband, the memory of her husband, and he reaches out and he says, help. Right. And, uh, and she's like, oh, I didn't know that he said that. And I was like, I'll actually put it. So I actually animated it. And you can't uh-huh. update a YouTube video. So the up, YouTube's not updated, but the Vimeo one is. It has, actually has a word in there for the hearing impaired <laughs> that I've wow. added. You are yeah. you are incredibly reactive to your audience. I am. <laughs> I know. I know. You take. You know. You do these. You, you know. You do these. These. I don't want to call it a contest, but you do these. These. You know. Eleven to five, which is really about yeah. listening to what people have to say. Which yeah, I'm I, guessing makes you. Um, would you consider yourself a, a collaborative person? Very collaborative, and I think that comes from my musical theater days. 
I actually had a guest on Brian McDonald. He's a brilliant writer, screenwriter, and he can just do it all in his head. And he runs it through like this audience simulator in his mind. And I've tried that. And he does, he doesn't do very many uh, versions. Right. <laughs> he, right. he writes, like he thinks about it until he writes it. Right. Um, I do tons of versions, obviously. Right. And uh, I think that comes from the time when I was in musical theater, especially when I was in a dinner, dinner theater. And I would stay in character when I would serve them dessert during the two acts of the show. <laughs> and I mean, it was so much fun. And I would have these people laughing, like just rolling. And, and right. people would be like, how are you making them laugh? And I was like, I don't know. I'm just being in character. You know? right, right, <laughs> and just right. interacting with them. And they're enjoying that. Uh-huh. And, and it's this, the stage was similar to that, where you would watch, you could kind of watch the audience and kind of get energy from them. And see how things were landing based on that. Right, right. And but, adjust, yeah. your, adjust your performance. Right, right. To them. Yeah. Now, sometimes that can be harmful. <laughs> <laughs> like sometimes, sometimes you can reach too hard or you can get into things that ruin the story. And right. you're, you're doing things just for a laugh. Um, but, you know, I've also learned that. When to pull back from like, I know the audience is really loving this, but this is more true to the character. Right, um, right. You know yeah. what? It's the same thing in making films, right? Especially animation, because you actually show those the story reels to an audience. Yeah. And you watch yeah. the reaction and you see what yeah. people are relating to and what they're connecting to, what they're not. If you're doing a comedy, you know, you can tell when people are laughing and when they're not. Um, and so, so you get to adjust. You get to constantly adjust. Yeah. Okay. You want me to read this feature film logline? Yeah, let's read the feature film. Okay. In a land worried by war, a young girl learns the magical secret of how to peel back the many layers down to a person's soul, leading her to discover many things, including a possible way to end the war. Yeah, so the natural progression for me from the the short film to the feature would be, well, let's do this with multiple people. Let's see how it's, it's different when you peel back the layers for various different people, and that gives right. you... It gives you a feature film. And then obviously you need something to tie it together. And this main character, I, I already felt she'd seen a lot of hard times. And one of those things is she'd been in war. Right. So that was kind of the natural, natural go-to for that. Um, something else I didn't mention is, you know, it, it's been interesting having this film out there. And I had like three out of 10 of the audience members watching this would tell me, I'm a little confused. And then there was a, like five out of 10 would get it. And then two out of 10 wouldn't want to tell me they were confused. So they tried to get it right. Right. Um, so there are many things I were actually in the essay. When, once you read it, that I would actually do to fix the short film too. Okay. You know, make it more clear, make it more uh-huh. compelling, make sure that I, I think that one emotion that is not effective in the, the director's toolkit is confusion. It just doesn't feel like an effective emotion. I see way too many things nowadays that kind of try to capitalize on confusion. Uh-huh. And I end up not enjoying them. Right. I, I end up thinking of Alfred Hitchcock, who would tell you the plot of his movie in the, t- in the trailer. You know? right, 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 <laughs> you right. still go see it and be thrilled by it because he knew how to tell a good story. Uh, how, how it unfolds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I agree with you. I think there are moments when confusion works as a storytelling element as long as you then come out the other side with the ability to 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 unravel that confusion right and say what you thought was happening wasn't really happening or all this stuff was happening at the same time and i'm going to unfold it for you Mm -hmm. and tell you what was actually happening from different points of view so but confusion in and of itself is not a useful tool tool for a director Right. Yeah, it can slip into negative emotions and positive very easily, yeah, too. Yeah. It's yeah, one yeah. of those emotions that, yeah. Hmm. Right. So, yeah. So, I remember when I watched the film, I had the impression that it took place in Russia. Yes. It Is does. This, does, this, does, this, does the feature film idea also take place in that, yes. in that time period? Yeah. 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 We were really inspired. I, I tried to think of something tangible that was close to this concept I was thinking of, and it was the Russian nesting doll. Yeah. And if you watch the, like the character designs, they actually look a lot like Russian nesting dolls, the way we designed oh, them. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. Wow. So, it was fun. On that film, I actually had to animate all, all on my own. I didn't even talk about that process. So the, this film came about because I had just done Vanishing Income Kickstarter and the head of animation from DreamWorks 
two heads of animation from DreamWorks founded Nimble Collective, yeah, which was an online studio platform. And then Amazon has since purchased that. So they were onto something really big about the future of filmmaking. Uh-huh. And uh, they, they mentored this, the process of this film as I storyboarded it and re-storyboarded this film. And then in the end, I, I was waiting kind of for a budget from them. They right. thought they might get one for me, but they didn't. So we did a uh-huh. Kickstarter that failed. Okay. Because I, I was working with a company that uh, I was actually working for them, building a creative division for them. And they're the, they were supposed to be the experts on crowdfunding. And, you know, over and over, we were just like, funding a film is hard. It's like the hardest thing to fund on a Kickstarter. Really? So very quickly, uh-huh. I was just like, you know, I can see this thing's not going to fund. I'm just going to take everything I developed for that and, and put it into these grant presentations. And I got a grant instead. And that's what funded the film. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. That and some capital I had built up by working with that, that company. So Right, right, right. Yeah. You know, there are so many ways to make something happen. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I think, I think another thing I'm, I'm recognizing in you is the, the sense of, it's a real sense of perseverance. That, that yeah. you don't, you don't, you don't take no as a no necessarily. So when you don't get funded, you find another way to, to keep moving forward. Yeah. That's, that's, that's admirable. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So let's talk about Vanishing Inc. So v- Vanishing Inc. Is, Vanishing Inc. Is, is your first book, right? It was technically the second. Oh, okay. The first one was called Invisi and the Misfit Supers. And I keep getting told I should include it in my pitches. I just don't want people to go read the book. I just, I feel it, like it was confusing enough. People had to read it twice to understand it. And I was just like, okay. you know, we're going to just shelve that one. Maybe, <laughs> maybe revisit it at a later date. But right, uh, right. I, yeah, think, this I, I think many artists have things much like that. Yeah. I was just listening to Neil Gaiman's um, masterclass. Oh, yes. And he, and he talks about multiple projects that are just in a closet that, that he'll never go back to, that don't, that don't deserve to be, to be actually read. And that, you know, a hundred years from now, when, when he's long gone, maybe someone will rip open that box and find something. Yeah. That he <laughs> never wanted to have to deal with in his, in his waking <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so I think we all have those kinds of projects that we, yeah. that we put aside and, and uh, rack them up as learning experiences, right? Part yeah. of how I became who I am. Yeah, exactly. All righty. So Vanishing Inc. A washed up magician has to save the world from disappearing. That's very direct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lo- well, it's also been around the longest, right? So. I've been able to kind of rephrase the log line so many times that, okay. yeah, okay. I think each of them will get a little bit more concise as we go along and a little bit right. more potent, but yeah. Right, right, right. Huh. Yeah. So, so you said earlier that you were, that you were interested in magic. Were you ever a magician? I did get a magic kick <laughs> when I was young. It had a hat in it, like this hat I couldn't even pull over my head because it was uh-huh. hard plastic. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, and I did play around with that uh-huh. a lot. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, so um, a male protagonist, a male protagonist, <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Not that a magician couldn't be female, but I know from the book that it's a male protagonist. Yeah, this story surfaced. Actually, the character surfaced when I wanted to for my animation demo reel. I wanted to have a magic character fly around and write my name. Okay. And I just, I loved him. I, there's something about him. And his design was way different than, than what this has come out to be. Right. But that's kind of why he's become the mascot of my logo currently, is because there's something about, I, I love the idea of being a magician. Right. And letting people suspend their belief and also giving them something meaningful to, to latch on to. Right, right. So, yeah, it's, uh, the interesting thing about this book is it's been around for so long it's really had time to like run its course, right? When did you write it? When when was it published? It was self-published in about 2014. Okay. And when I did the Kickstarter, I was like, someday I'm going to pitch this as a feature film. And 
it was almost like within two months, within one month, I think, of me getting the book in my hand, the studio I was at asked for feature film pitches. <laughs> oh, really? So that was pretty cool. It's like, is that a sign or something? You know? and, 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 did, and did the studios know about this because you reached out to them? Or how did they, how did they know that this book existed? Well, so the, this, the first studio I actually pitched at, they just asked for pitches. Okay. They just thought it would be a fun thing. thing. They, they were used to doing contract work where they would animate somebody else's thing. Okay. Like they, they worked, I worked on Barbie Spy Squad when I was there. <laughs> and they were also doing Bob the Builder and Open Season 4. Okay. And uh, yeah, so they wanted to do some original projects. Okay. And so they were just looking. Okay. And uh, yeah, so I was among probably 30 people who pitched, I think. That and, sounds familiar. Uh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. They did these do the same thing at uh, at Disney, where they yeah. had something called the Gong Show. And yeah. you would pitch oh, ideas. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. And that's where I won that agent that I told you about. Okay. Who knew she couldn't help me publish it, still encouraged me to do it. You know, yeah. she she's a wonderful, wonderful person. I'm glad to have had her as part of my journey for the, as long as she was. Right. And uh, yeah, so the interesting thing about this story is I would actually change it a lot, right? And you'll, you'll be able to read that in the pitch at scottweiser.com slash collaborate once, uh -huh. once I've approved your application <laughs> uh -huh. and, uh, or you've already read it, but uh, yeah, there are several things about the story I would change and uh, that's good to know. And the other thing that, so this is something that happened during the Kickstarter is my friend who was a Disney character designer and had a lot of friends throughout the industry said, there's somebody who's hype in the industry. I can't tell you who they are is looking at this as a series. <laughs> okay. And I was like, well, who is it? He's like, I can't tell you. <laughs> He's like, you'll know if you hear from them. I was like, okay. <clears throat> but they're a backer on your campaign. So I know they're one of my backers, but okay. there's some, there's some backers who have a cryptic name. So I'm guessing maybe it's them. Okay. Um, but good, good for that experience because I started thinking like, what would it be like as a series? Right. Right. And I know, I know now know how it would be, you know, there's a, there's a 30 year period that I just zoomed by. I was trying to kind of do what they did with up where you have that series of the, uh, the sequence at the beginning. It's very emotional. You see the right. light pass. I was thinking, well, let's do that at the end. And uh, I mean, that's 30 years and a lot, a lot that could happen during that time. There's a lot right. of potential in there. So yeah, it's one that could be expanded to a whole series, which would be wonderful. Oh, wow. And it's really the only one that, that you've thought about as a series. Yeah, I don't think I think in series. Yeah. 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 And, uh, Although um, there could be a series to the to the Unsingable Song. There could be a sequel. I have one in mind. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and Mass Magic has a potential sequel. So there are a couple that have a potential sequel. <laughs> sequel, uh -huh. as opposed yeah. to a television series, you see them yeah. more as sort of franchisable titles that could go on, that could live on. Yeah, yeah. And again, you have to do those carefully, right? You have to have a really good, again, a spark of something that really drives you to do it, not just to do it for a cash grab. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah. ultimately about the characters, right? That the characters have the ability to live past yeah. the story that you've told. Yeah, or there's another way for them to learn and grow and develop. Right. right. Which, I mean, every human has that, right? So it does indicate that sequels are very possible, and we've seen them done really well. Right, right. But, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Got to have a reason to do that. So that's all 10 pitches. <laughs> that's kind of amazing, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, so again, what you're, what you're putting forward is this idea that, that, that if people want to actually read all of these things and, and, and investigate deeper, that they can go to your site, mm -hmm. right? And so apply. Apply. Yeah, slash collaborate. Yeah. I'd like to know what your background is as a producer in the industry and what your interest is in collaborating with me specifically. Right. So that's really what the application is. And, and as long as I can see that somebody is, uh, you know, sincere and that sort of uh, thing. I'll send you the pitches, let, let you right, see them. Right, 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 right. And not well, necessarily for someone who just wants to read them. Like, right. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a beautician and I've yeah. seen your, your, your video and I'd really like to, I'd really like to read these things. Yeah. You're aiming more towards sort of a, a, a professional in the industry who might be interested in producing. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And there will be a little, 
this will all see the light of day at some point. You know, I just right. uh, I just want to kind of slowly roll it out. Right. And, you know, again, I have that producing partner that uh, hopefully we get to work together. But as you know, in this industry, things aren't final until they're final. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The truth, I can't tell you the number of times I've been right at the starting line and to have things not not work out. So, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I just want to have all these different things growing and, and I want to find a good person to work with and hopefully right. we can make something magical together. So. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you so much again for, uh, you've been there since vanishing. Inc. You really have. I remember I was doing the Kickstarter and I came and visited you at DreamWorks. Uh huh. Um, Cirque de Solitude grew out of Brenda's blog. She wrote a lot about, uh, her brand of feminism, which uh -huh. really, I mean, reading her post, I was like, yeah, I'm a feminist <laughs> according, to, <laughs> according to this stuff. It's, it's um, interesting because when I was reading the outline for it, I, I thought, I wonder if if this professional that he's talking about is Brenda. It was Brenda. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and so you you've just been such a, a great example to me of how to how to work hard and how to get things done. And you've been very encouraging. So thank you so much for being the one to help me unveil these these full pitches to the world. And uh, you are so welcome. Yeah. And as our outro, I have directed or animated on more than 50 projects, both short and feature length. And obviously during this whole time, my goal is to direct an original feature animated film. And the dream is closer now than ever. And if you are interested in collaborating with me, you just go to scottweiser.com slash collaborate and you can read these pitches. So until next time, I hope we all get a little wiser. You have been watching the Directing Animation Livecast with Scott Weiser. Audio version edited by Kiera Horowitz. Copyright Scott Weiser, LLC 2020.